Welcome to CASA Presents Your Mental Health. I'm Leslie McDonald and I'm the moderator for this very special COVID-19 series. CASA Child, Adolescent and Family Mental Health is a respected not-for-profit organization that's been around for more than 30 years in Alberta, providing assessments and treatment services for infants, children and their families. Well, for three years now, they've been sharing their vast network of expertise and resources through the Dr. Roger Bland Lecture Series. During this pandemic, we bring that discussion online, giving you reliable, accurate information to inspire conversation, hope, and wisdom. We want to give special thanks to Alberta Health for making this series possible. We also want to thank our ongoing partners, Edmonton Public Schools, the Institutes for Health Economics, and the University of Alberta Department of Psychiatry. We also acknowledge Global Edmonton for their partnership in this monthly series. Now the format is quite simple. We bring you sort of an overview from a respected expert and then we have a panel discussion with different points of view. The topic this month is system erosion and advocacy. And that's because in the midst of this COVID crisis, there is another growing pandemic of mental health. And while the need is increased, resources have decreased and in some cases, they've completely disappeared. We're going to hear from different sides of the topic with our panel, but first, we're going to hear from our expert, Dr. Gail Andrew. Dr. Andrew is a developmental pediatrician at the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital and a professor of clinical pediatrics at the University of Alberta. Gail is also the medical director of the FASD, or Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder, clinic at the Glen Rose, and she's a founding board member of the Canada FASD Research Network. She is the appointed external expert to the Alberta Government Committee overseeing the strategic plan for FASD and improving systems of care in our province. Her work has been recognized with the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, first of all, I want to ask you, what exactly is developmental pediatrics? Well, I've had the great privilege of being a developmental pediatrician in practice now for, oh my goodness, over 40 years. Wow. What we do in developmental pediatrics is provide diagnoses for complex neurodevelopmental conditions. For example, autism spectrum disorder, learning disabilities, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, intellectual disabilities with or without a genetic component, uh, and a whole long list of others. Often those are developmental disabilities are comorbid with a mental health condition. So it's sometimes difficult to separate the two of which is primary and which is secondary. Yeah. As a pediatrician, I do the medical diagnoses, but I require a full multidisciplinary team to work with me. Psychologists, speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, audiologists, who will do the functional assessment. Because I always say, me diagnosing, Autism spectrum disorder is a three-letter word. It has to give meaning to that particular child and family to make a difference, a positive difference, in that child's developmental trajectory and the quality of life of the family. So that functional assessment points at the strengths and the challenges of the child. Part of my job is then to make recommendations based on what I know of what that particular child needs. And my role in the intervention piece is quite small, providing a prescription for management, say, of ADHD or a mental health condition. Most of the supports and services that our children with an mental disability or mental health needs requires a multi-system approach. Um, in, especially in, in the early years, it requires speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and so on. As a child goes through the school system, these are lifelong conditions, their needs in transition change. And we, a system of supports and services, we need to be on the mark to walk, you know, go through each transition with the children and families and make sure that there isn't a cliff that they're going to fall off before they get to the, to the next support and system that they need. So that is 
my job description. I cannot work alone. I require my partners in mental health, school systems, and the other human resources system of care uh, known in Alberta as Family Support to Disabilities, who provide some in-home supports, community aids for children with complex disabilities, and most importantly for families, respite, that very important break to prevent caregiver burnout and added stress. So my piece is really small. I'm a little kind of cog on the wheel, but it is a very big wheel. And right now I have been experiencing personal stress as I see the rest of the cogs in the wheel not being there to keep the momentum going. A diagnosis alone is, without supports and services is a disservice. It's a label. Well, you know, it's now, it, we've been talking for, uh, since I've been doing this, we've been talking about how there haven't been enough services for the need and we needed to increase services. And now we've got this double whammy happening where we've got COVID, so we've got an increased need even further, and we've got cuts. So let's talk about that erosion that's been happening, and especially during COVID. How have you seen that in terms of your practice? Well, I, I see it every, every day because since mid-March, I've practiced exclusively through Zooming. So I am joining families in their kitchen, living room, wherever they're, they're taking their Zoom calls to try to support their, their children's needs. Um, and it, I think the families are much more comfortable in their own home environment sharing their high level of stress. They're, they're not trying to hide or camouflage behind that mask that I'm, I'm a great parent, I can do it all without a system of support. No, nobody can do it all without a system of support. And I've, I've talked about my own concept of what has been happening as two big tsunamis colliding at the same time. Neither of them perhaps were planned, but they have collided. And I'm going to talk a little bit about science. Um, in mental health and in developmental pediatrics, we talk a lot about ACEs, adverse early childhood experiences. Lots are known about the, the first 10 ACEs that were described, neglect, abuse, domestic issues, such as domestic violence in the home of a child. These traumas, have a lifelong impact on early childhood brain development and on later learning, social emotional development. And as we follow children who've experienced this kind of trauma, lifelong, it, it has an impact on both the, as an adult, their own mental health, but their physical health. Huge cost to society in the long run across a lifespan. The World Health Organization a few years ago said, hey, wait a minute. 10 ACEs, uh -uh, we get two more. One is natural disasters. And this is they've well documented. They, they use examples, fires, floods, hurricanes. They're natural disasters. And I think COVID fits that description perfectly. It has occurred. We didn't create it. We are trying our best to deal with it and curtail its spread but it, it is a natural disaster. The other World Health Organization disaster is man-made. And the prototype is war, where children are impacted by war. And I am proposing what I'm seeing and what families are telling me that this new man-made disaster that we're looking at are the funding cuts, changes in service eligibility and service delivery how we access services and how we transition across services. This has all changed and it predated COVID. Uh, and also prior to COVID services were not even keeping up with the demand. For example, autism is now in one in 60, six zero children. Who would have predicted that 10 years ago? But I think what I have seen and what I've heard from a lot of my families and the other people I hear from on Zoom, I do school visits by Zoom too. I get to talk to teachers. I get to talk about what it used to be like when you had an educational assistant who could do that one-on-one -on -one with that child when they needed it. 
So th this level of you know, erosion in supports and services was already on the way. And then we had the, the other tsunami wave hit it head on with the, the COVID pandemic. So I, I see, we, you know, where can we focus our energies and how can we make positive changes? Because we have to make positive changes. We can't, um, you know, we know through adverse experiences, you have a whole body stress response. It's not good for you. And with whole body stress response, your mental health needs will, will usually increase. Almost all my families use the word stress, they use the word anxiety, and that's what I'm hearing from my teach the teachers when they join in on our Zoom calls. So I think we all need to work at this together and what what can we change? And also I think there's a timeline. Um, we know that chronic stress is, is really the worst. If you don't have hope, if you don't see that you have some control or someone is listening and someone will work together with you to make a change. That, it's that hopelessness. So I, I think we have, a, I'm going to put it out, we have a call to action right now to make differences. So Gail, I want to talk about this. As I'm going to ask a two-pronged question because one of the things that um, you certainly brought up that you've heard your entire career, and I've heard it consistently many times across the spectrum, is that you've got to catch kids early, like really early. Um, and, um, and so I want to put that in context in terms of the, so some of the changes and the cuts, but also the fact that this is not just about children with autism. This is also about a whole wide range of difficulties. I think that I read 28% of kids in, uh, in Alberta uh, report challenges even with reading, understanding language. Um, that's huge. So this impact is really widespread. Uh, that's a great example when you bring up communication. Because communicating our ideas, feelings, wants and needs is essential. So any child who has an early delay in speech and language development, um, with or without any other delays in motor skills or cognitive functioning. That communication is critical and it's really important to provide that child with supports and services in their early preschool years as early as possible. And even, you know, under age one, we begin just with basic read and sing to your children. That's part of this communication language development. It starts probably before you're born with how your mother sings and reads to you before you're born. But it's really, really critical to catch these kids with those early delays in speech and language development. Because um, they will struggle, they become frustrated. And if you've ever seen a three-year-old who's frustrated, you're going to see two things. You're going to see a child who's externalizing and behaving and tantruming and throwing things and behaving badly. Uh, but when I look at a behavior like that, I do an ABC. A is for antecedent. What's causing the behavior? He's frustrated because he can't let you know what he wants. B is the behavior that you sure see, but also what's the behavior communicating? That's my what why I do ABCs all the time. When people ask me, what do I think of this behavior? And can I fix the behavior? I say, whoa, let's see why it's there. So you've got this child who's frustrated. Another child who's more prone to be an internalizer is going to become quite anxious. It's going to shut down when they can't express wants, needs, and feelings. So you can either have that really in your face tantrum kid or this little quiet kid who's trying not to even be noticed. If you can't communicate, your parents get frustrated too because they are guessing 24 seven what you want. And parents want to do the best they can, but they feel they let their kids down because they can't guess. And what happens on the playground if you can't speak clearly or communicate your peers, even as young as age three or four, are going to say, hmm, what's different with you? I don't want to play with you. You're not on my team. Or you're different, so maybe you are going to be targeted for bullying. So having even a, a simple delay in your ability to communicate has ramifications in your social and emotional development. But it, as well as we do know that language 
difficulties early on. There's a strong correlation like phonological awareness and your reading skills later on in life. And if you struggle in reading when you enter the school system, unless you get you know, focused early intervention, maybe one-on-one -on -one pull out with that educational assistant or in a small reading group, you're gonna struggle in reading. And somebody in high school who's not a uh, good reader, will, it impacts all of your learning. And then look, if I take this across the lifespan, because that's what we do in developmental pediatrics. Our kids have a habit of growing up into lovely young adults. If you can't read as a young adult, your literacy impacts your employability options and your further training. So when you've got, if you don't invest early, you're going to pay a lot extra way down the line and keep paying and paying, plus that loss of productivity, what the potential of that kid could have been. And maybe they would have had a much more enjoyable social life as somebody included it in the games on the playground. So that's where I see early intervention is, is so critical. Um. Is it fair to say that most of the cuts that have been happening, and they're really significant, more than 50% sort of across the border, are happening with early development? And the second part of that question is, what have you seen in your practice? Some examples. It must be incredibly heartbreaking for you to see what's going on out there. Well, with the um, early childhood services, there's been significant cuts, even the number of sites. Uh, it was in the Edmonton Journal in the series that they've had this week on you know just asking the community for numbers and feedback from community and members in their groundworks work that they're doing and like significant cuts the number of sites in Edmonton public have been almost cut in half and those are the sites where children with two significant delays in development would go and attend those programs before entering kindergarten this year is called program unit funding. They have cut that the third year of program unit funding. So now we have children as young as age four years, eight months with severe delays in usually two areas who are now being integrated into regular kindergartens with 20 plus kids where they used to be in a smaller class with more one-on-one -on -one intensive supports. And many of these children at four years, eight months are acting and behaving like a much younger child. They're not ready for sitting in a class of that many kids in kindergarten. So we've lost a full year of support. And that's just been a, a, re, a recent change. The changes for, from kindergarten to grade 12, uh, there's been a, a transition of funding from the regional collaborative services. And that was the service that cross ministries that provided SLP, OT, audiology, uh, speech and language assistance services, mental health services. It was collaborative and coordinated and focused on the needs of child, school environment and community for that child. So a real nice cross ministries approach to support. So that funding is gone. Uh, it's been transitioned to each school jurisdiction who can then decide how they're going to allocate that, that money that's been transitioned from the RCSD system. And we're still really waiting to see what that looks like because each school division may have their own priorities depending on their community needs. So we are, I think we're just in holding pattern. I feel very, very uncomfortable with that because I used to be able to know what would be expected in the school systems, or for that matter, with FSCD. I, I have to say to families, well, last year I would have recommended this, but this year we, we really don't know. But if you ask my opinion, your child would benefit from this level of support. So I, I think it's kind of that feeling of the unknown when I described how in your early childhood trauma, how when you're not in control and you don't know what's going to happen and it's chronic and ongoing, you, your stress goes up. Well, I, my stress is going up because part of my work is helping families 
and I don't really feel I am doing a good enough job because I don't know what to recommend or what the family is going to get. And maybe I'm going to set the family up for disappointment. Well, you're put in an impossible kind of situation. And I'm sure some parents feel like you almost have to have a PhD to understand how to navigate the system, how the system works, how to get anything out of the system. It's, um, and that's what it was like before things got more complicated and more difficult. Well, system navigation is so important. Um, you know, knowing where to go to get what you need. And part of our assessment when we we're doing our assessment is pointing out these are your areas of strength and these are your areas of need. So we, we give a, a little bit of a, it's a bit of a recipe. These are all the ingredients you need to make a good cake. But you know, where do you go to get each individual ingredient? And then how do you can get all those ingredients mixed together, communication, collaboration, to have that, you know, nicely risen cake, that good outcome. So that's where we need good navigation. We need good knowledge of what's out there. And that has to be very transparently communicated. Um, I do have one of my moms who has a PhD and she struggled in navigating all of this spider's web out there. And I, I do like the analogy of a spider's web. Because boy, if you're not on the thread, you're falling between those cracks, between the, the web material. Wow. Okay, Gail, we're going to come back to you again with our group discussion. But I want to introduce some of our other panelists. Um, uh, first of all, Candace Fair is a parent with lived experiences in Alberta's child, youth, and youth mental health uh, systematic care interventions. And as a professional, Candace is a social worker um, and uh, has encountered many community families whose struggles in child youth mental health systemic care have mirrored your own, Candace. And, uh, you know, one of the thing, the reasons you're here as well is because you're co-chair of CASA's uh, Family Advisory Council. So I'm very, very pleased to have you. And, and I want to start with what we were talking about with an erosion of services and how things have been cut back. Because you've been in this system for a long time and you've recently lost your job. You're part of the cuts as well. And you're not alone. Yeah, no, I'm definitely not alone. So. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie, for uh, inviting me today to speak. I'm over the moon happy to talk about this topic. And uh, I just want to say a special thank you to Dr. Gail Andrews because yeah. her level of genuine care for family and community is exactly what we need, um, you know, especially in these unprecedented times. Mm -hmm. Um, as co-chair of the Family Advisory Council, uh, what does that mean? What's my role? Yes. Uh, basically, I get to sit with amazing parents and caregivers yeah. uh, from a broad uh, background. We have caregivers who are foster parents, uh, who are adopted parents, blended families, single families, same-sex families, you name it. We have a diverse group of caregivers who lend their stories, their lived experiences to our community in hopes that we can better our systems. Mm -hmm. um, but what's ironic is that it, when you listen to our stories, there's this common theme, this common thread. Mm -hmm. And much like Dr. Andrews just alluded to, um, it's that erosion of support. Where do we find it? Where do we go? So you get a bird's eye view in this subject in, in ways that not very many people have. The council is fantastic. What a great concept. But what are you talking about? What are you seeing? What are parents alarmed about? Well, going back to my profession and my recent job loss, um, I was right in the midst of what we call our PUF funding, or our early childhood education piece. So I was employed as a family support worker within school division and had the pleasure of working alongside OTs, speech uh, language pathologists, child psychologists, etc. And we would offer this wraparound service for our wee little children entering our school systems. And what is really amazing to me about early intervention and what I observed firsthand was exactly what Dr. Andrews is speaking about. Early intervention matters, right? Teaching skills matter, not just to the child, but also to the family. 
And so with the erosion or the eradication of our third year PUF funding, what does it mean to me? What, what, what does that, you know, how does that align with myself? Well, I can find another job, Leslie, yeah. right? Yeah. But in the back of my mind, in the 100 families that I had on my caseload, one family in particular comes to mind. In October of 2019, I helped a family receive a diagnosis through assessment from the Glen Rose. Yeah. And when I had to say goodbye to that family in June, when I was let go of this, this year, mm -hmm. that family was still waiting to get appropriate supports through our systems. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is unacceptable. And, and, and ethically, I, I, I'm just like Dr. Andrews. I sit here and I think, did I do enough? Did I help enough? You know, um, and, and how do you support families or, or tell them where to go when you don't know yourself? Wow, you said that, um, that one of the things that you're seeing both within your job and with the family council is how families are really struggling. Very much so. Yeah. And a gentle reminder that a lot of our families that are involved with CASA or whom you know, have to navigate mental health systemic care, those struggles were there prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's another layer of complexities to deal with, right? But we already uh, were enshrouded, some of us, on a daily basis with the unknown. Because that's what entering into mental health systemic care is. Mm -hmm. Truly, it's the unknown, mm -hmm. right? You don't uh, have a true awareness of what you're getting into until, until you're in the thick of things. So. Well, FAC um, Family Advisory Council has been putting together a, a plan as well that, that makes a difference. Can you talk about that? We have so many plans in the works. So yes. first of all, we, we began in 2014, so we are about six years uh, young as a council. Mm -hmm. uh, and we began just with this vision of how can we best support Edmonton and area families. And one of those ways was uh, we felt it was really important to get a peer support program. Mm -hmm. So we now have at CASA what they dub as parent in residence program. Mm -hmm. So that was a very big initiative that we took on. Why? because we know that it's not enough to refer a family or a caregiver uh, to a resource. What, what we need is to have somebody walk alongside that, that caregiver and say, I understand or I, I know what you've went through because here's, here's what I went through. Mm -hmm. And there's always that commonality there uh, when we're living in stress. Wow, what have you learned from that uh, in terms of uh, support and needs and, and then what you're seeing out there for people who don't have access to something like the Family Council? That's a brilliant question. I, I've learned so much. It would be so hard to answer that succinctly. It is such a big question, but one of the things I've said for a number of years is as a social worker and, and as a community advocate, I know nothing. Because you see, I think that we have all these misconceptions and, and stigmas and judgments when it comes to mental health. And when I go to my lived experience and the things that I encountered and the moments in time that I went in my head and said, but you don't know me, yeah. like you don't know. And so I know nothing. And, and I carry that forward in community because I feel that when individuals, parents, caregivers, child youth feel safe, They'll tell us what we need to know, but it's up to us to open that, that safe space for them. And, and right now, our safe spaces are lacking. I want to get into that a little bit more when we get into the group discussion. I want to introduce two parents who are also on the Family Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. These are both single moms. Their stories actually are quite similar, uh, oh, which yeah. makes it uh, um, very oh. interesting. First of all, I want to introduce Shauna Sebri. Did I say that right, Shauna? Is it Sebri or Seabri? I forgot to ask you in advance. It's Seabri. Seabri, okay. So you have three adult children. Uh, you have five who are living at home with special needs. Um, you have three adopt, that includes three adopted boys, and then two that you call your bonus children because you're waiting to adopt them. Um, Shauna, by the way, has a background in special education, including psych nursing. But Shauna, even with this amazing toolbox that you have of knowledge, you said that what you've been going through, and especially now with COVID, and then with the cuts, 
the things that you're dealing with, um, there's not enough in your toolbox to help you. So I can't imagine what it's like for other people. Uh, yeah, it's very difficult um, on a day-to-day -day basis to try and, and support kids and know what resources and agencies are available for them. But um, there are times when a family goes into what we call crisis, where um, they need higher supports or more supports than we generally hear about in the community. And it's a real struggle to try and find uh, what best supports your family and, and, and the child that's at risk at that time. And I, I find that during COVID especially, because a lot of the agencies have either shut down or their unlimited uh, ability to take clients, that um, the struggle is beyond real. And so um, what I typically have in my toolbox for um, trying to support all my kiddos is um, not meeting the needs of what I need to do to be able to uh, keep my keep my children um, safe and to be able to have them fully supported. Well, you call yourself um, a, a crisis family. Um, do you mind sharing what sort of the lay of the land is within your household? Um, sure. Uh, so our family is currently um, in in crisis. Um, my 13 year old son is not living in the home. Um, that's been a, a very large challenge for all of us and especially for him. Um, we are waiting for um, an option of a, a treatment facility to support his needs. Um, he has a whole slew of diagnoses and a very large amount of mental health going on. And um, this is uh, un uncharted territory and waters for me. Um, being in this situation. So um, I, I think that when we connect with other people who are in similar crises, uh, that we're able to navigate this journey a, a whole lot easier. But yeah, currently, again, my son is not living here and, and I'm trying to get all the supports and, and services available to, to, to support us all, all the children, myself, and him. Wow, and you're a single mom. How are you managing to do this? Because of course you have to earn a living. Um, you've got to make sure that your kids get the best, uh, the best resources that they can. That must be, uh, I can't imagine what that would be like. Um, <laughs> My hat's off. So I have a, a really large support system and I recommend that those who don't to try and connect with other uh, persons that that have similar needs as them. I have um, extended family that supports me. I have community members and I have this wonderful group called my tribe and we are all a bunch of special needs parents that are uh, sharing resources, activities. Um, we quite often will remind each other that we need to take self care and to be gentle with ourselves. And uh, we'll occasionally um, just just laugh. Humor helps. Well, you talk about your tribe. I'm going to introduce another member of your tribe next. Her name is Meg Smale. She's the mother of six children, four adults by birth and two teenagers by adoption. Both teenagers experience significant challenges. Um, uh, the older one is 16 years old and he now, I think, is, has been diagnosed with FASD, Meg. Um, before it was suspected. Yeah, we're <laughs> yeah, so he also has several other mental health challenges and he's currently living in a group home, which we'll talk about. Her youngest son, who's 15 years old, also has a diagnosis of FASD and Down Syndrome Plus, which creates some interesting situations at home. And Meg, you're the one who used the word interesting. Um, when I look at your situation at home, it's a real safety risk. And uh, you combine that with COVID and, you combine, and, and, and what's been happening with the cuts. This is, you know, this can create some pretty dangerous situations for you on the home front. And you're having a hard time being heard. I am having a hard time being heard. Um, with the cutbacks right now, um, I'm being told that some of the services that my older son needs could potentially be cut. He's doing really, really well in his support slash group home. 
He's got amazing support there. And the system, such as it is, wants to see that change. I know for a fact, after lots of discussions with lots of people and my CASA FASC family, because I don't know how I would do some of it without them, they, he would be set up for failure, we would be set up for failure, and my younger son would probably be injured. I think I've made a dent a little bit in the lower levels that we're allowed to speak to in FSCD and SFP. And now our case is going forward to the upper echelon, whoever they are. So every day goes by and we have meetings when my son first went into an out of home placement, it was definitely a safety issue and it still is. What happened, Meg? And what's that? What happened? Tell us, tell us what the circumstances were. So we can so the audience can get an idea of exactly what you're talking about. He was doing quite well. Uh, he was going to school and things were happening behind closed doors that I found out about a year or so ago. Um, my younger son, because of having Down syndrome and FASD, has very, very limited communication capacity, at least orally. And so he's often hard to understand and he often covers up things and then just puts it inside and becomes very, very anxious, just like Dr. Andrew said. So um, it just, something was going on. And... There was aggression in our home. Furniture got broken. Furniture got thrown. Um, he has a whole bunch of other issues beyond mental health and behavioral. And we were exhausted. It's just my adult daughter who also has some health challenges living at home with me, with the boys. And we just couldn't do anymore. So we started with out of home weekend respite and that helped until my younger son on Sunday nights when we would go pick up his brother, start to cry and become incredibly anxious. And so as that went on, we could see by that summer. So July two years ago, June two years ago, we knew that he needed to be out of home so that we could all do some healing. I love being this little boy. Well, he's not so little anymore, but he's still my little boy. I love being that little boy's mom. I love him with all my heart. I just cannot live in the same household as him and feel safe or have my younger son feel safe. His stature is less. He's getting stronger with adolescence like every other adolescent male. He's never going to be a very big person. And so he physically is at risk of being injured. My older son, when in his first group home placement, disclosed to staff that he had been on a regular basis beating on his little brother. So they shared a bedroom. So things happen behind closed doors. And I felt awful. As a parent, I thought, I know boys wrestle and struggle. I've got two adult sons. I never... I knew something was going on, but I didn't know what was going on. So when that was disclosed, it just, it made sense. If my younger son is in the same room as my older son, he doesn't want to be in the same room. If he's sitting far away from him, it might last for a little while, um, but not for long before he's gone to sit somewhere else where he feels safe. He's witnessed so many rages, even though we try to protect him from them, that if in the community and programming in the community, another child has a rage, he freezes and shuts down and then does not want to go back to that program. And he won't even let his brother's picture be on a shelf in our dining room. So it's, it's been a long battle. Sorry, that's a long story. That's okay. It's a, it's, I mean, we, I wish we had more time to talk about it because it, it has many layers and many implications. And one of the things that, that's huge for you and very real is that if your son doesn't get the funding, if, you're, if he's forced to come home, 
What does that mean for you and Drew, your, your younger son? It would mean some changes in our home. We already have locks on things to keep my little guy safe. His name is Drew. Um, he gets into everything. He's definitely doesn't function at the age of a 15 year old. And so we have to have locks on our kitchen cabinets, but they're magnet locks right now. We have to, we have padlocks on our fridge and freezer. Our storage room has a key lock on it. And so does my bedroom and my daughter's bedroom and his bedroom too. Um, not to lock him in, but if he's feeling unsafe in a situation, he can go and lock himself in. He's got that strategy for himself. We would probably need to have some doors changed over to stronger doors and new locks that are more secure. My older son has broken into my locked bedroom when he lived at home. All he used was a Pokemon card that had been laminated. That's all it took for him to figure out how to break into my bedroom and then things went missing. So locks would have to be upgraded. We would have to let the local police force know that he was home in case he made a break for it. We live downtown. I love our neighborhood. I love our community. I'm not, and I can't afford to move. So we would have to make do with what we've got, upgrade security within our home. And Drew at 15 would have to move into a trundle bed in my bedroom. And I would have to switch out to like a day bed for myself. And Jaden would, Jaden would then go into his brother's room because they cannot share a bedroom anymore. It took almost a year, almost two years, the first two years of Jaden being out of our home before Drew was willing to fall asleep and stay relatively asleep in his own bedroom, in his own bed. That was a battle for the first almost two years that Jaden was out of our home. So it would mean big changes. We'd have to have a security plan in place again, where my daughter who lives at home, hopefully she'd be home when a rage happened, would grab the cats if they weren't hiding already in her room and drew and lock her bedroom door. And I would sit in a safe space until the rage was over. He has slammed doors so hard at home and at his caregiver's home, that he's broken the door frames. So this is a pretty strong kid when he's raging. And he's now been doing other things that are very, very unsafe. He's not safe on internet of any sort. And we're having to set up special procedures for him at school. And uh, he's now one of the lucky kids from his school that has been exposed to COVID on his school bus. So he's at home right now and his mental health issues are making it really hard for him. He can be a sweet kid. He can be very sweet and loving and it can change in a heartbeat. Okay, we're gonna come back to, uh, to some of the, the things around this experience, but I wanna introduce one more panel member. Um, Shaher Bano Ahmed is a first year student in neuroscience at the University of Toronto. Her interest in the brain and its impact on behavior and cognitive functions began with her lived experience with her brother who has autism. And that's how she also got involved in CASA's Youth Council and became an avid mental health advocate. Thanks so much for joining us. And um, you know, the last time you and I spoke, you were not, I mean, you were in high school, you were in the IB program, all kinds of challenges with that, missing your grad. Now you're in first year and it's a whole other set of challenges and you're advocating at the same time. Give us a bit of that lay of the land. Yeah, so um, as university starts, there's a lot of different programs that they've tried to create to help students. Um, but obviously with COVID, it's become even more difficult because obviously the um, programs they have that existed, a lot of them haven't been able to be taken online. Um, for example, at the University of Toronto, they have different programs to help students um, who need help with tutoring or with um, study groups or having scholarships and things like that. Um, and a lot of those study groups and tutoring can't go online um, and they don't, a lot of the scholarships have had to be canceled because 
uh, the the organizations that offer those scholarships don't have the funds anymore or they want they want to save their funds for other things because they don't know what's going to happen next um and i know i've noticed also that a lot of um the services that they offer in terms of mental health so uh their counselors and stuff they're all very very busy because they're trying to do things online i mean especially difficult if you live in a different time zone than them because um, obviously for me, it's not as much of an issue. It's just a two hour time difference. Um, but for some of my friends who are international students, that's like a 12 hour difference for them. So they can't access any of those services because they would have to get up at 3 a.m. or something like that. And that's not really healthy for them in terms of like sleep schedules and everything like that. Um, so it's been very difficult to try to adjust to university life without being able to access any of these services. Um, and so a lot of the advocacy work that I've been doing right now is still centered in Edmonton. I haven't been able to get involved very much in Toronto because obviously I'm not there right now. Um, but a lot of it is around online schooling. I know with my brother, um, with him, it's been very difficult to do things online. He's going to school now in person, um, but he still has his own cohort away from all of the other students. So he's by himself all day. Um, he has his teacher with him and then whenever he goes to a different classroom there's like four staff members that accompany sorry that accompany him everywhere um, so he's feeling very isolated from all of his peers um, he's not allowed to go into the classroom with the other students or engage with them um, and so that's been very difficult for him as well um, and so a lot of my advocacy work is in trying to create inclusive spaces especially for children with developmental disabilities, because those developmental disabilities often come with comorbidities that include um, physical disabilities, such as like asthma and stuff like that, that make it even more difficult and more dangerous for them to engage with one another. And one of the projects that I have like as an example is that I've created a kind of virtual movie club. Um, so that's to kind of give everyone a chance to connect with each other online, kind of watch a movie together uh, and talk about it and kind of feel connected, even if we can't be connected in person. Wow, tell us about some of your other advocacy work, because you do work with Inclusion Alberta, for example. And, um, and you talked about um, uh, some things that maybe most of us wouldn't think about, like scholarships being cut, and the impact of that, and the, and the, the, the online conference that everyone seems to be dealing with. Yeah, so um, as part of, Inclusion Alberta's Youth for Inclusion team, we're trying to create, so you, the Youth for Inclusion conference is a conference that happens every year that includes uh, everyone, all youth who are involved in kind of inclusive work in the community to help uh, people or advocate with people um, with developmental disabilities. And so, so it's kind of a chance to connect with one another and learn from one another. Uh, and this conference used to happen in person in Edmonton, but this year it's online and that's come with a lot of different challenges as well. Because like, for example, I know for my brother, like if you were to put him in front of a Zoom call, he would be fine, but he would not be able to set that up for himself or um, to know where the unmute button is or try to figure out if there's technical difficulties, what he should be doing. Um, and that's the case for a lot of the people that attend these conferences. So trying, mm -hmm you can do your best to try to include people online, but the online um, the online layout itself creates so many difficulties because there's so many unexpected difficulties and technical difficulties that come with going online um, that you can't really account for. I mean, obviously we can't go to these people's houses and try to help them because with COVID restrictions and that's not really possible for us. Uh, and then additionally, there's also the challenge of like, not being face to face there's you're missing a lot of the connection that you could have with people you can't really do activities that you would normally do you can't really participate in different discussions um, sometimes there's like uh, delays in voice um, and sometimes with people especially if they have auditory processing issues or visual processing issues the computer screen itself um, and the computer audio can be difficult to understand so there's a lot of different aspects that play into uh, trying to take advocacy online. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, I'm going to bring it now to the to the group discussion because as she's talking, I'm thinking about how one of the common themes is that, you know, it was challenging before, but now with when you add the COVID in, it it makes it. There's so many different layers to this discussion. 
Candace, I've seen you nodding your head just as she was nodding. talking. Just yeah, nodding. Yeah, just nodding, just going, right? Yeah. So many layers. I, I'm in my head and I'm thinking, uh, you know, Sheher Bano brings yes. the sibling perspective. Yeah. So a lot of times, you know, we talk about the parent caregiver and child youth relationship, uh -huh. but uh, something we've identified at our council and, and certainly the uh, youth council at CASA uh, supports this is is the impact on the entire family yes. so sibling perspective right uh, that's what I'm thinking about and then further to that when we look at this family centered approach or this together centered approach and you know Dr. Gail Andrews was just so transparent in saying I'm even struggling mm -hmm. it just brings to my attention again the importance of mental health wellness for everybody right, for all parties involved. So we can't overlook how this impacts, you know, all members of, of immediate family and community as well. So one of the things that every single person in this group said to me when we had our private calls first was that the system is broken. Gail, do you want to address that? Well, I'm going to add another voice before I answer that question, and that's grandparenting in COVID when we can't see our grandchildren because of either personal risk factors of health and age. But I have two recent stories of one mom, a single mom who is an essential health care worker. She has no child care. We didn't talk about child care yet because child care did close down and what what should we be providing for child support during COVID is certainly something we need to look at carefully with the risks, she had no option but to send her child from the Edmonton area to another remote area of the province where the grandparents had to learn how to do online schooling with a limited te technical support. Had another lovely grandfather, just love him to pieces. He's got an open heart, but he's also got an open door. So he's got a lot of grandkids living with him. He was so proud recently, he said, I fixed the problem that we had last year for online schooling with having four kids to share one computer. He bought four different used devices, but now he's using the food bank. So he, because he's used up every bit of his own personal savings. So just, you know, let's not forget the grandparents in this because it, you know, we, we we're very fortunate to have extended families. Not everybody has an extended family person to fall back on. And I always think of my kids like who are in foster care and group care and aging out where they don't have a Meg to fight for them. We, you know, those children, are, young adults are extremely vulnerable because we've now lowered the age where a child will continue to get supports when they're in uh, under the umbrella of children's services. So system erosion, there's, I think every system has to really take a close personal internal look at what has my system done in maybe contributing to some of the stress? What can my system do to make a difference? Um, Leslie mentioned I, I had the great privilege to be part of the Alberta Government Cross Ministry Committee on looking at how we support fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. It has to be collaborative. I think each system needs to do their own personal look, but then we need to have a systems, cross systems table where everybody can come together and bring their own system solutions, but then see how it integrates with all the other system solutions. That's what we do at the cross ministry table. It's such you know, a pleasure to be able to have open conversation where, and, and nobody is right and nobody's wrong. We are doing this as a collaborative effort. So that's one of my hopes that we will be able to work through the current situation to come out more successful at, at the other end. So for the larger segment of the population that, I mean, everyone's impacted by COVID, but for the larger section of the population that perhaps isn't directly impacted by, um, by the cuts, by the ero system erosion, by what's happening with mental health, 
Whenever I do a story, the first thing I always ask myself is, why should anyone care? So if they're not directly affected by this, why should anyone care about your story, Meg, or what you're going through, Shauna, or the things that you see at the Family Council, or what you see in your practice? Why should anyone care? You want to take that on? You want me to take that yeah, on? Yeah, I do. Uh, so very often in my working community and work with families, uh, why should you care? Because I, we know the statistics. Mm -hmm. We know that one in three adults mm -hmm. are managing their own mental health wellness journey and struggling at times. Mm -hmm. And we know that one in five children or youth are. And further to that, we know that those numbers are probably not accurate, yeah. right? Bigger. They're bigger. Mm -hmm. So why should we care? Because it impacts all of us mm -hmm. in some way, shape or form. Whether again, we are a grandparent, a caregiver, a parent, a teacher, a neighbor, a coach, you know, we will come across someone in our lifetimes, guaranteed over and over, mm -hmm. who may be seeking you know, validation or some sort of help from us. So that's why it's important. Yeah. I know Meg and Shauna, you both have, uh, I think it's you Meg who says, uh, your motto is advocate, advocate, advocate. So uh, you know, what are you getting as you advocate? What are you hearing back? What response are you getting? Often it's a response of, well, the policies and procedures say X, Y, and Z. And I'm going, well, the policies and procedures and the legislation needs to be changed. And often the workers that I've talked to agree. I don't take anything from any worker anymore. I try and be polite and I generally am polite and respectful and just state my case as it is. I need them to know that what they, they need to look at the whole family. Currently, they look at the one child. They say, this child is in our program. He's in one of our support homes. Your time is up. He's got to come home. And they don't even tell about what kind of wraparound supports that they may offer when he comes home. They just talk about, well, he has to come home and we need to make a plan to see how that works. So... Like I talked about earlier, I, I tell them that this is what we would have to do. I also tell them that because where we live downtown, if my son was to bolt, which he does, and he lives out in the suburbs where there's lots of space for him to bolt and still be relatively safe, if he comes home to downtown and he decides to bolt, we may never see him again. He may hook up, who knows who he'll hook up with when he heads downtown into some of the areas that are maybe not as safe. We may never see him again. Or if we do see him, he'll be dead. And we know that. So this is what I do. And I always try and bring someone with me, whether it's um, our support from Coaching Families, which is a nonprofit group that helps support families that are raising children with FASD. Uh, I bring my adult daughter who lives at home. If she's at home because she's in online learning too at university, I've got at least her ears as well listening. And this last, and I don't stop. I go to the minister's office and contact the minister's office. I contact the critic for the minister. I contact the opposition leader. I contact my MLA. Um, I contact supervisors, managers, and plead my case with all of them. I've been told it takes longer to get a response then. I'd rather have a longer time to get a response where I get something that I can deal with. The systems that the policies and procedures need to be more straightforward. I looked at the policies and procedures for supports for permanency recently, and it's about four inches thick. I mean, how can anyone who works in that system who has huge case loads know that those policies and procedures? I'm just looking up what I think will help me state my case. And I don't know if it's going to. And I heard from our current SFP worker, supports for permanency worker, that some of the legislation or policies are changing December 1st. 
which will make it harder for kids who need out of home placements to stay in them as long as they do. My son should not come home for many reasons. And I'm being told that I may not have any choice. Child intervention services may become involved. And I'm going like, I'm trying to protect one boy from the other. I'm trying to protect some of my neighbors who have mobility challenges. I can't imagine what would happen if he raged out of the building we live in and knocked one of them over. I would feel horrible. There's so many complex layers to why we can't bring him home. And like I said, he's a sweet kid. We can have visits. Usually they're not sleepovers. Before COVID, we would leave my little guy Drew with a respite worker. And then we would go visit with my son. And now that's a little bit more challenging to find a respite worker that we feel safe with because it's so hard to know whether someone has been exposed accidentally to COVID. And my little guy has asthma in addition, like he's got Down syndrome, FASD++. And he has been in hospital with pneumonia in the past. And so I really hate to think what would happen if he contracted COVID. I don't think his immune system would fight it very well. So there's, there's so many layers and the system says, well, we don't care. This is the way it has to be done, basically, is what you get from them. And I'm going, well, who's above you? I will go talk to whoever is above you. And our co-chair for our, our Family Advisory Council, Dr. Denise Milne, has been an incredible support for me, saying, keep fighting. Stand your ground. And my son is 16 and a half. In a year and a half or less, he will be transitioning to PDD. We're in the middle of that process right now. And if I bring him home, even for the short term, how hard is it going to be for me to find him a place? He's in a placement that he can stay in, into adulthood. Why would I want to change that and disrupt his life? He's got enough issues and enough depression and enough anxiety and impulse control issues, which means he's hurt himself a couple of times in the last few months. Um, we, he doesn't need that and neither do we. I don't want to be as worried about him as I will be if he comes home. And I don't wanna to have to deal with worrying about what will happen to little Drew if he comes home and how that will impact him. I'd like to hear from Shauna on this because Sorry. Shauna, it's okay, it's good. Uh, Shauna, part of the issue here, isn't it, that, that people don't really understand what it's like. I mean, it's, it's hard to get resources and get people listen when they don't really understand uh, what, what families are going through. Uh, you're absolutely right, Leslie. I think that a lot of times they go by their policies like Meg was talking about or procedures or previous experience with families. And it's a whole different ball game when you're living inside the home and you're talking about when there's crisis going on, what do we do? Um, plenty of times we're told, you know, call the RCMP, call the ambulance. Um, they don't necessarily have uh, trauma informed lens so that they can support us through that as well. Uh, it, it is exhausting trying to find resources to support uh, families in crisis. The advocacy that we have to have is ongoing, like Meg said, all the time. The agencies are, are pointing the fingers at each other. It's their job. No, it's their job. During COVID right now, uh, the, the group homes are full or some are already closed or the funding's been cut. There's barriers to everything we try and do with our children. And again, Meg has already expressed this, but it, it affects more than just the child that is in crisis. It affects the entire family, the children, the parents, the siblings, the extended family, the friends of the child and moving a child who is in a place already. My son's been 
I think it's been six months now that he's been in his setting and he's been moved around many times within the agency. I can't imagine someone saying to me, it's time for him to come home because our family just would be in a higher, we would be in absolute crisis then because I would not be able to keep my family safe. And I'm not sure that he would be able to keep himself safe. Wow, Shahar Bono, you said that, uh, um, that advocacy is even more difficult now in times of this COVID uh, crisis. And, um, and I wondered, what have you done and your peers uh, you know, the, the other students, what are you doing that's helping to cut through the clutter to get some attention to this when everybody's just focused on the physical, you know, going to get the virus? I think what I've really been impressed by um, is the number of organizations started by youth that have kind of come up in the past six months or so. Um, I personally have a youth council that's kind of uh, more focused on civic engagement, but we have a mental health portion as well to it. Um, but the other organizations that I've seen that students have created in response to COVID, there's so many different things like having um, podcasts to kind of give out the information about mental health, having accounts on Instagram or on other social media, because that's a really good way uh, to spread information, having accounts like that, that just spread information about how families are affected by COVID. Um, there's so many different organizations to do with uh, mental health information, mental health advocacy, um, so many different organizations that are trying, um, so many different projects that are being created that are trying to help kids that are feeling isolated or um, not feeling safe uh, during COVID times. So I thought that was really, really impressive of uh, youth to have created themselves when they see that organizations created by adults and the existing organizations aren't being, uh, aren't filling in those gaps. So they're filling them in themselves. Wow. Gail, what are you uh, doing that's helping the families you're dealing with uh, that are going through crisis? What are you finding? What are you finding that works? Well, a lot of my families uh, feel very isolated right now but just uh, with, they don't have a family advisory council to go to. And I think from Shada and Meg, you know, your mutual support of each other is very powerful and strong. That I think we need to encourage families to keep connected to other families who are going through similar struggles because a voice of one is a voice of one, but if you bring together similar voices with the same story, that is powerful. So I've been encouraging along with you know, self-care, just connecting, whether it's online to other families going through this. Uh, and certainly, you know, I encourage the families to connect back to both myself. And uh, I work in another clinic setting where I have access to a group of mental health therapists who do some family support as well. Don't be afraid to reach out. You don't have to be doing this all alone. You know, you, even just bouncing ideas off somebody can, can be helpful sharing your story so that you know, again more voices make a stronger point i'm really excited to hear about what the youth are doing because you know they're our future and maybe they'll be the future people making policies and will make their policy with this more human informed background because Every, I always look at it come up from a systems perspective, at the center of this system is my child with neurodevelopmental disability who comes with a family. Then their family belongs within their community. And then all of this has to be strengthened and interconnected. Um, I, that child is not a child with a condition. That child belongs within a family and community. So that's how I always think of I have to work with the kid, I might prescribe one prescription, but I also have to change how the family is being supported. I have to change the community supports that are available. So that's the kind of advocacy role that we try to do as developmental pediatricians. We too are a small voice within a, a big system, but we keep trying to, you know, 
I, I'm, it's very hard to get me not to talk. I love to talk and give me an inch. I'll take a yard or a foot, whatever it is, to try to, to get in there. And it's, a, I think, a cliche that I would like to use again. We don't pay now. We'll doubly pay later. Um, Meg, you implied your concerns about your almost transitioning young adult. If you know he doesn't have adequate education, you know if he isn't successful at PDD, what is where is he going to be able to work? Where is his income coming from? Now, where is he going to be able to live safely? Because you've implied already, you see homelessness in his future if he isn't supported by the system appropriately and safely. And somebody who is hopeless and homeless, they still have to eat. They, they are very vulnerable to becoming involved with the criminal justice system. Because if you're hungry, you're going to take food. It's a survival instinct. Then we will get into that whole revolving cycle of once you get into the justice system, if you have a neurodevelopmental disability, you may not be understood or you may not understand all of the language within the criminal justice system. And uh, I've had a lot of my you know, young adults uh, who I followed since they were quite small, just get into trouble because he didn't understand and they agreed with everything. They agreed with everything on their probation list. It hadn't a clue what it all meant, but they agreed to it all because they're very, very wanting to please and be agreeable. So I look at this, the cost of that journey is huge. It's, and when we go back, who should care? Everybody should care because that's your tax dollar. That's, you know, your community who may not be safe because there's an increase in theft and gun, and gun violence. Yes, it does impact every single person. And could we have made a difference by going back to early childhood supports and then the appropriate supports across that individual's lifespan and supports for their family and caregivers as well. And at each transition point, making sure they get that when they navigate to the next system, it's a smooth handoff and not just, okay, you finish with that service, the door is closed, but you know, we don't tell you where to go next. So I think it's an everybody's problem and everybody has to be part of the solution. That's a really good way, a good place to end this. But before we do, I want to give everyone a chance to uh, give sort of a very quick, any final thoughts, anything that you would like to pass on to families that are struggling or anything you'd like to say about the cuts or anything you'd like to add about advocacy, um, uh, a small uh, piece that you'd like that maybe hasn't come out yet that you'd like to add to uh, to this discussion before we close up. Candace? I always have stuff that I can add, Leslie, you know that. Um, I just want to really point out that when we uh, as caregivers, as parents uh, face crises and, and we are caregiving to the best of our abilities for our children, oftentimes we don't show up as our best self. And that's because we are under extreme stress ourselves. Uh, what I want to point out though is that you know you've had the opportunity to speak to two of our council members and the complexities that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Meg and Shauna present very calm and they prevent, present very educated and, and rightfully so because they are the professionals of what they're going through. What I want to point out though is that I'm getting tired of just talking about this. Um, we have the ability to express ourselves. We have the ability to say, hey, this is what's going on and this is what's happening, what's wrong. And we've been saying the same things as a council since we started in 2014. Um, so I guess, you know, in, in, in wrapping this up, what kind of a parent or caregiver does our system wish for us to present as? Because in my experience in working with hundreds and thousands of families, literally, if you are not engaged, if you are too quiet, you are stigmatized as a parent who maybe doesn't care about their child or love their child. If you, like myself in my personal journey, become enraged 
because you can no longer handle the invalidation you are receiving, then all of a sudden you're not listened to either. So as a council, we've refined our speech, we've refined our approach, and, and you see the proof in that today, mm -hmm. and yet these ladies still struggle immensely. Mm -hmm. Why? And how can we change that, you know? Secondly, the, the other thing I want to point out, and, and thank you, Dr. Gail Andrews, for saying this, that parents should support parents. You know, in a medical field, we have, you know, parents that can support each other. Let's say even with diagnoses of autism, you know, parent support groups. What I have found and what made our peer support initiative uh, stressful at times was that there's this barrier again that we as parents or caregivers are responsible for the demise of our children, which is not always the case. We can play a role, but that doesn't mean that we are totally accountable, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so again, when as a society, when as a system, do we start understanding that A, parents are the professionals of their children and they really do know what's best. And it's very rare in my profession, again, working with hundreds, if not thousands of caregivers, to come across a parent or a caregiver that says, you know what, I don't give a crap about this child. Mm -hmm. Do with them what you may. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. Every story, every, every word today is born from a place of love mm -hmm. and, and at times, Leslie, desperation. A lot of desperation, Lots. I suspect. Yeah. Meg, do you want to follow up with your final thoughts? And we'll just keep them a little short. I will do that, I promise. Continue to advocate no matter what. I think I've fine-tuned it. It's been a long time. I had to advocate for my adult children when they were kids too and taught them to advocate for themselves. My younger two can't really do that. So keep on advocating and keep notes, keep records. Um, notes and notes and notes and notes. Document, document, document is something that I've found is helpful. Shada? Uh, I, I think similar to Meg as well about advocating, but I also wanted to uh, share that it's really important for us as parents to share that story with people and to help people better understand about our children and the importance of, of them being included in our society because they are in our society and the struggles that we go through. And boy, oh boy, when you have someone who uh, either you've had a conversation with or you're in a, a group session with or you've just met them on the street and they actually listen to you and validate it, that is so empowering and it it's almost like it gives us um, energy to move forward with our families. And I think the um, one of the key things is, is that we all want to be uh, our best and do our best and our children will do their best when they can and and the struggles are are real for all of us wow shahir bono um i have two things as well <laughs> sorry i'll try to keep this as short as i can but the first thing is that now when we need advocacy the most when we need these supports when we need organizations to help amplify people's voices now is the time that all of these initiatives are for basically they're four times of crisis they're for making sure that people that need to be heard are being heard even when um, people are only listening to the loudest voices when people are panicking um, but right now though that plan of advocacy is kind of falling apart because those supports are not being given to the people that need them and the people uh, people's voices are not being amplified so there's kind of a failure of the kind of theory behind advocacy I see. Um, and I think that can really be remedied by giving people more supports and amplifying their voices more now when it's needed most. Um, and the second thing that I was going to say is that um, we also have to consider the impact on people, um, on the barriers that people have if they don't speak English, if they have a different cultural background. Um, because obviously in this conversation, um, all of us are very good English speakers. We all have uh, we all have um, experience working in an in, in English speaking world, um, but in different and when 
people are immigrants or they come from different countries, different cultural backgrounds, then it can be difficult for them to advocate because they may not speak the language or they may not understand the system and they're coming from the outside. So they may not have any supports or any people who will help them understand. And that makes it even more difficult for them to advocate. Wow. Um, Dr. Andrew, I know I said final words, but um, one of the things that struck me talking to you when you were telling me about your families, I thought, wow, you know, what keeps you going? You must see just incredibly heartbreaking things and, and some things that lift you up. But what keeps you going with this work? Why is this work so important? It's been over 40 years. And I think what keeps me going is I see successes, you know, not what, you know, 100%, but I see small baby steps forward. That's what keeps me going. If we didn't keep advocating, pushing, it, we would never get there. I'm going to quote one of my, my teachers, Miles Himmerlich, who people who attended some FASD conferences know Miles, he's the spokesperson for FASD. He keeps reminding us, nothing about us without us. And I think some of the decisions have been made without us, and we are all readily available. Um, more so now with Zoom calls, but I've always welcomed any invitation to perhaps present on issues, to contribute to working groups. And when I hear the power and the passion in this room, I think we would all jump at the you know, suggestion, could we come and work in advising people who are developing policies? We're all, we're all available, we'll come. So I think we need to be invited and maybe maybe I need to knock on more doors to say that I have a lot of free time. Let's get together and have a working group that we can come up with solutions. I don't want to leave this on a negative note that nothing is working. We can work together, solution focused to make a difference. Just invite us. Wow, what a great way to end. I want to thank, what a wonderful, passionate group. Thank you so much for sharing your stories and, and sharing your perspective. Dr. Gail Andrew, Candace Fair, Shauna Sebri, uh, Meg Smale, and Shaher Bano Ahmed, thank you so much for joining us. And, um, and Dr. Gail Andrew, you're going to be on uh, Global, well, you've already been now on Global News Morning. Um, and um, and uh, there will be a link for that on the website uh, for uh, with your morning news interview uh, on the website for CASA. Um, we'd also really appreciate uh, to our audience if you could share your thoughts about the session by taking our survey. So uh, we ask you to just click on the link uh, that's in the description below. Your feedback is just so important for us to keep these topics relevant and informative and enjoyable. And finally, I mentioned earlier that CASA is a nonprofit organization. Um, and your support of CASA's work with infants, children, youth, and their families is very, very much appreciated. Any donation appreciated. You can find the donate button on the website at casaservices.org. Um, on behalf of CASA Child, Adolescent, and Family Services, Mental Health, Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Leslie McDonald. We will see you again next month. In the meantime, stay safe and stay healthy.